thank you everyone for coming out. You should certainly feel free to continue and eat while I'm while I'm talking. If you don't like what I'm saying, you can just throw something at me. <laughs> I might be slightly peckish, so I would appreciate the, the little nibble. Um, as a graduate student uh, here at the University of Michigan, I wrote my dissertation on charismatic musicianship in southern Vietnam and the methods used by leading musicians to promote and maintain traditional music in the rapidly developing scenes of everyday life in Ho Chi Minh City and the Mekong Delta. Studying charisma in southern Vietnam brought my attention to more widespread and emergent processes in contemporary Vietnamese society concerning creativity, or the rhetoric used primarily through modal practice. Uh, to re-energize traditional music performance and establish new ways of deploying effective sounds for consumption. Creativity is built as a tool of power, often by those who lack systemic authority. Uh, one might go so far to argue that creativity is the weapon of the weak, generated in reaction to hegemonic forces, not to overcome or overtake these forces, but to mold these forces to be more hospitable. These hegemonic forces are historical, imagined, uh, sometimes viewed as friendly and other times as foe. The task of the cultural theorist then becomes discerning historical circumstance relevant to contemporary cultural production, the diversion from historical trajectories in the contemporary period, and the complicated contemporary moves of musicians and other cultural brokers. In this presentation, I focus on the ways that southern Vietnamese musicians interact with, utilize, and divert from Chinese music and musical models from historical and contemporary periods. And I highlight the ways that musicians cultivate these creativities for these models and reposition traditional music as relevant for the second decade of the 21st century. For some, deploying Chinese characteristics is simply humorous. For others, recognizing Chinese influence accentuates the musical distinctions between Chinese and Vietnamese music. A small number of musicians even argue that adopting specific Chinese techniques helps Vietnamese musicians build a music better representative of the Vietnamese soul. So they take Chinese music, inject it into Vietnamese music in order to highlight the Vietnamese characteristics of this music. Chinese music is deployed, therefore, in diverse ways as an effective interlocutor as musicians seek to sustain Vietnamese traditional music. Engagement with Chinese musical models in Vietnam, as well as engagement with recent geopolitical disagreements between the two countries, inspires Vietnamese musicians to develop a more global world music presence. More specifically, working with and through Chinese models both encourages literal and virtual mobility for Vietnamese musicians and increases diversity in traditional music practice that leads to greater interest in the consumption and production of Vietnamese music. To work through this argument, I begin with descriptions of the historical and musical engagements between the two cultural areas. From time to time, I take sojourns into historiography, looking at the way that Vietnamese musicologists have bracketed and described Chinese musical influence in Vietnam. I then focus on the ways that contemporary musicians interact with the music of China. I conclude by proposing what I term post-socialist creativity in contemporary southern Vietnam, predicated on the diversity and mobility of Vietnamese musicians. The history of social, cultural, and political interaction between China and Vietnam is intertwined and often strained, and I'm certainly not the expert on this topic in the room John Wooden is. Um, so I might defer certain questions to him. Um, today, the Vietnamese language is peppered with numerous Chinese terms. Stories and myths passed orally are used today in theatrical and opera productions in both cultural areas. And so there's this sort of source of myth from which both areas draw. Um, in Vietnam today, there are groups of Vietnamese speakers uh, living in southern China and large groups of Chinese speakers, specifically Chiao Zhou, uh, speakers living across the Mekong Delta in southern Vietnam. And so there are Chinese living in Vietnam and Vietnamese living in southern China as well. There have been periods of cooperation and peace between the two areas and as late as 1979, war between the two countries. Um, anyone following current events in Asia knows today of the current disagreement over the ownership of two groups of islands in the South China Sea, or what the Vietnamese call the Eastern Sea, being known. In everyday conversation today, uh, individuals try to situate Vietnamese tradition within the 
what has been termed many times to me as the 4,000 years of Vietnamese history, um, as somehow separate from Chinese tradition. This proves difficult given the centuries of side-by-side -side development. Many early stories from Vietnamese historical narratives begin with the Lac Viet Nam Sung period, centered uh, in the Red River Delta in northern Vietnam, from which the infamous Dong Sun drums originated. In 111 BC, this area came under the control of Chinese rulers of the Han Dynasty and saw the importation of Chinese philosophy and the development of Vietnamese Buddhism. Vietnamese scholars, both historically and recently, have depicted this control in a negative light, often to serve as a rallying cry of Vietnamese nationalism. According to a July 2014 article in the Thanh Nhien newspaper, a national newspaper in Vietnam, uh, the author wrote the following, quote, the southern branch of the Han Dynasty despised the ethnic peoples living in the region, which included the Viet people. For this reason, the process of ethnic assimilation undertaken by the Han Dynasty involved the extermination of the bronze drums. Many Dong Sun drums succumbed to smelting, end quote. Can I ask in, a question? Those drums, what were they originally used for before they got... Oh. <laughs> I mean, what was their purpose in the society? Um, there's some disagreement about this. Uh -huh. Some view them as purely ceremonial. Um, many will say that they were never used as drums. Okay. They just look like them. Um, but there is a belief that they're a lot of ceremony. Uh, in other nationalistic descriptions uh, from the contemporary and historical periods, this, uh, this period of uh, Chinese rule over Vietnam saw, nu uh, saw numerous attempts to repel Chinese military leadership, uh, the most famous perhaps being an army led by two sisters, Tung Jack and Tung Nhi, in 42 AD, uh, who were defeated the next year. These are oftentimes called the uh, Tung sisters, Hai Bok Tung, um, and I'll play a clip from a performance later in this talk. Uh, that deals with the, uh, these two uh, sisters. In 939 AD, the Vietnamese created an independent ruling dynasty and embarked on a period of relatively uninterrupted self-governance uh, until the mid-19th century. There are, of course, exceptions to this. Um, between 1407 and 1427, for example, um, the area that was then known as Vietnam Dai Viet uh, came under the rule of the Ming Dynasty of China. Uh, this is a period, uh, this 20-year this period in the 15th century, uh, is one where uh, contemporary Vietnamese find many national heroes who expelled various invading forces. Uh, this period also saw the beginnings of a slow expansion southwards of Viet Cao lands um, in what's called the Nam Dien, or southern expansion from northern Vietnam through to contemporary southern Vietnam. These lands included by the 15th century part of the kingdom of Champa, in present-day central Vietnam and by the 18th century part of the Khmer Empire in present-day southern Vietnam. As China had ruled over Vietnamese lands, Vietnamese ruled over and overtook Champanese and Khmer lands, now within the boundaries of present-day central and southern Vietnam. Undeniably, um, Vietnamese musical production, as I now transition into music description, uh, has been influenced by that of its northern neighbor. The question of when and how is open for discussion. Looking at Vietnamese instruments such as the Dan Chaim, the 16 or 17, 17 scissor here, Dan Kim, moon shaped lute, or Dan Ka, uh, the lute, uh, sorry, the um, fiddle, excuse me, at the end of the row there, uh, indicate many similarities with their Chinese counterparts, the Wu Zheng in the case of the Dan Chaim, uh, and the Arhu in the case of the Dan Ka. Ethnomusicologist Chen Fen Ke uh, frequently speaks of the origins of this instrument, the Dan Chang, using similar mythologies associated with the origins of the Hu Zheng. The Vietnamese Dan Chang was created when two daughters split between themselves a 25 strained zither, uh, presumably the uh, se uh, shown here, leading to the development of instruments that ultimately developed into the 16 string zither, and more typically in southern Vietnam today, the 17 string zither. In histories of the Wu Zheng, and I should actually stop here and apologize for my mispronunciation of the Chinese language. Um, I speak Vietnamese and I'm starting to learn Chinese, so I apologize. Um, in histories of the Wu Zheng, uh, similar stories appear of splitting a larger 50 string instrument by the Yellow Emperor or in another version of the story uh, by two quarreling brothers. 
Um, there is also a myth that stipulates that, uh, like the Vietnamese version of the Vietnamese Dan Chai, um, a 25-string instrument was split into two uh, and given to uh, two sisters. Uh, Chinese music scholar Cao Zheng uh, cite, uh, cites the uh, following uh, text, or this text here, um, which indicates, quote, two sisters of Qin fought over a se, broke it into two halves, the elder taking one having 13 strings, the other taking uh, the one with 12 strings. The Qin emperor marveled at it and named the two instruments Zheng, end quote. Although Cao, uh, this Chinese musicologist, does not dismiss the commonalities and possible related origins between the se and the Zheng, he does speak, uh, he does seek, excuse me, to categorize these stories as myths. Uh, unlike Chen Nake in Vietnam, who presents them as uh, partial truths, at the very least. In Vietnam, uh, many musicians find these myths preposterous, um, although some do continue to believe them, noting that the Den Chain developed from the Wuchang or a similar instrument and was altered over time to suit Vietnamese modal and language aesthetics. The relationship between Chinese and Vietnamese music repertories and genres is less apparent. We can't simply rely on musical or music instrument iconography. But these similarities between the two genres and repertories is well known by music specialists. Uh, Chen Banke writes of the relationship between Chinese court music, Ya Yue, and Vietnamese court music, Nha Cung Minh, first in the court at Thang Long uh, in northern Vietnam, uh, and again in Hue in central Vietnam when the court moved there. Staples of central and southern Vietnamese traditional music have Chinese music, uh, Chinese counterparts, and the repertoire, uh, repertoire of the Qin seven-string zither. The piece Flowing Water is found as Lu Tui in Vietnam and Lu Shui in China, for example. The interesting thing, though, is that the melodic content of these two pieces is completely different. Um, so we're not quite sure why um, the piece title was adopted in, uh, in, in Vietnam, but the melody was not. There are tunes, however, um, with different titles in China and in Vietnam that show a remarkable melodic similarity. A central Vietnamese tune, Kim Tien, meaning golden coin, is also found in the Jin Nan Siju, southern Chinese repertoire, as Hua Liu Ban, uh, eight, uh, excuse me, elaborated six beats. And I'd like to play um, brief clips uh, from these two uh, tracks to give you an indication of the similarity between the melodies. So I'll start with uh, Kim Dian, and I apologize, I have to run for into iTunes in order to do it effectively. <coughs> So this is Kim Dian, the Vietnamese version. melodic similarity uh, between uh, these two repertories. 
but we're not quite sure how or why they made their way from southern China to, to Vietnam. Beyond musical iconography, the degree of musical influence of Chinese music and Vietnamese music has been fiercely debated in the 20th century. In 20th century Vietnamese music scholarship, written in the early 20th century in French and later in Vietnamese. A 1956 study published by uh, the journal Bulletin de la Société des Études in Indochinoise uh, by Nguyen Minh Lai uh, opens flatly with the words, quote, Vietnamese music directly derives from Chinese music, end quote and then continues to describe how the instrument scales and notation derive from Chinese sources. Although a detailed history, a strongly worded rebuttal was published three years later in the same journal by Chen Banke. He disputes some of the points made and points the reader to a substantial uh, book, uh, La Musique Vietnamienne de Chanel, that serves as a stronger refutation of the belief that Vietnamese music simply de uh, derives from Chinese music. John Banke notes, for example, the diversity of musical influences on Vietnamese music, uh, including Indic music, perhaps from Champa, and the Javanese Pelog seven-note scale on the music of Central Vietnam. Writing in their short and mid-century La Musique Viet Traditionnelle, of uh, Vietnamese traditional music, two other scholars, uh, Nguyen Yan Bak and Nguyen Phung, uh, point to the origins of Vietnamese musical aesthetics, as opposed simply to scales or instruments in, southern, uh, in historical China. <coughs> uh, they write, quote, the honest man in ancient Vietnamese society is versed in music, poetry, painting, and in chess. Music is a sacred art. All, music, all musicians who respect this will vigorously conform to the edicts of the legendary Chinese emperor Fu Hui or Fu Xi, end quote. Uh, these edicts include not playing when there is intense cold, heat, strong winds, wet weather, snow and thunder, as well as wild mourning, when the sound of the drum or other instruments troubles the musician, when the musician feels ambitious or dishonest, when the musician does not take care of personal hygiene, and when cologne is not present. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, one should only play in the presence of a knowledgeable audience. And so these two Vietnamese scholars are arguing that the same aesthetics hold true, uh, in Vietnam, and these were adopted directly from China. One master musician in southern Vietnam, with whom I studied extensively, professes similar senti uh, sentiments as ideal for proper performance, but also indicates that contemporary performance settings and practice reflect modern ideas, therefore thereby deviating from these uh, ancient Chinese ideals. Playing traditional music in a hotel lobby, for example, in Ho Chi Minh City, features many kinds of cologne worn by, those, worn by those who know little or nothing about traditional music. So things are changing, certainly. Scholarship within the past 20 years has taken a more strategic approach to Chinese influence. Uh, the scholarship often has a nationalistic tinge, but Chinese influence is not dismissed outright. In fact, in many of the remaining descriptions provided in this lecture, I point to parallel and mutually reinforcing narratives that pinpoint strategic distancing from Chinese influence and politics and tactical adoptions of Chinese music. So two things are happening. Some are moving away, but also tactically adopting from Chinese musical influence. In a 1990, uh, 1998 treatise published in Australia titled <coughs> Chinese Music of Vietnam, uh, a book about this instrument here, scholar Le Tuan Hong moves away somewhat from Chinese influence by arguing that one of the most iconic Vietnamese instruments, the zither, did not, as previously argued, develop from the Chinese guzheng, but from an ancient Southeast Asian bamboo zither. Cao Zheng, uh, the scholar that I quoted earlier uh, from China, makes a similar argument about the guzheng, noting that it may have developed from a bamboo zither of some kind. However, in his understanding, its origins uh, were Chinese and not Southeast Asian. Although Le Tuan Hung's study has not taken hold in academic circles in Vietnam today, scholars find it primarily unconvincing, um, it attempts to ground Vietnamese music within more, uh, more within historical development of music in Southeast Asia rather than East Asia. Um, and there are some other uh, reasons why this is possibly the case. I mentioned earlier that there are some scales found in central Vietnam that are very, very similar to Javanese, uh, Indo-Chinese, excuse me, Indonesian uh, scales. 
In this book, uh, Lake Hon Hong does point, however, to the adoption of Chinese music and aesthetics as an antidote to French influence, which began in the 1860s. Um, the late 19th century into the beginning of the 20th uh, in southern Vietnam featured significant transitions as Vietnamese musicians adjusted to life under French colonial rule and the imposition of French aesthetics and the organization of new institutions. Musical forms that had more direct connections to China were augmented. Chinese music became less of a model and more as, a, as, more as an interlocutor against which and through which musicians achieved particular musical goals. The genre of music of southern Vietnam called the Ngatayu, meaning music for diversion, uh, exemplifies this method of engaging with Chinese music. Scholars and musicians advocate that at the end of the 19th century, pre-existing forms of traditional music were no longer interesting to young audiences. Um, these older genres uh, included hot boy or duong, a type of opera similar to Chinese opera and typically involving Chinese stories. During French colonization, education in the Chinese language began, began to decline, uh, with the increase of uh, the number of students studying the French language in Pukmu, the Romanized Vietnamese language system. So interest in Chinese characters and Chinese language was declining. Uh, writing in 1972, American scholar Glenn Hauk uh, notes that fewer audiences therefore understood the Chinese stories being told in hot boy performances, as they had not studied the language. Uh, and also, they also hadn't studied the stories either. In addition to moving away from the, lang uh, from the Chinese language, they were moving away from Chinese uh, culture as well in the 19th century. Other musicians worried uh, as well that without some method of preserving, uh, preserving this type of opera, it would disappear. Uh, musicians and audiences therefore began to renovate this music to ensure its survival borrowing compositions from Hot Boy Opera to create a new instrumental genre than Katayu to preserve the Vietnamese tradition. Um, and this lasted until perhaps the 1910s or 1920s uh, when a similar process started again, uh, when uh, people were worried that this genre of music, than Katayu, would, uh, would not survive uh, because it wasn't modern enough in essence. Uh, and so what theater directors did is they adopted strategically from Ben Katehu, the genre of music, from hot boy performances that were still going on, although in smaller forms, and developed a renovated theater genre called Gailun, um, in order, and Gailun essentially means renovated opera, and in order to attempt to bring in new modern aesthetics, but also present something of history, something of Vietnamese tradition, something of Chinese stories and myths, etc. <coughs> Early Gailun music mostly <coughs> resembled Dan Kataitu, uh, but since directors decontextualized the music from the Taiku setting and viewed the music as subservient to uh, theatrical procedures and plot lines, therefore, or thereby leaving very little room for improvisation, which is central to Dan Kataitu, uh, the music for Gailun quickly developed on a different trajectory. I'd like to play you a very quick clip of uh, Gai Lun's performance in order to give you an indication of how this music, or how this theater changed in the beginning of the 20th century. The first sound that we're going to hear here doesn't sound anything like either Chinese or Vietnamese music. <coughs> Yeah. 
Miss Kippa had just a little bit to give you an indication of some other music. <coughs> So Gai Leung is very, very interesting in the sense that it draws from many, many different theatrical and musical sources in order to generate a kind of modern music uh, for the early 20th century, century originally. Um, and now this, these modernizing techniques uh, continue to take place. Chinese music and stories were not dismissed outright uh, from uh, Gai Leung and Dan Katehu performances, but were used more strategically. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, some Chinese music and stories were used as resistance. Uh, during the French colonial period. Uh, Lake Tuan Hong argues that Vietnamese musicians embraced other Chinese music aesthetics as a way to turn away from French colonial influences. One of these includes what the Vietnamese call the Hei Guang, or Guang Nuance, uh, a technique that may have predated its use as an anti-colonial tactic, but that continues to be used to pepper performances of Dan Gai and Gai Lung performances. The technique involves playing a pre-existing piece of music in the way or in the manner of a Chinese tune by changing certain modal roles associated with the piece. In southern Vietnamese traditional music, there are three primary modes. Uh, Diu Bac, or the northern mode, used to play happy tunes. Diu Nam, or the southern mode, used to play sad tunes. And Diu Wan, or a mode used to indicate profound melancholy. Each mode has different pitch content. Uh, usually five primary pitches, but this is not always the case. Ornamentation and paired notes play together, uh, are played together in order to structure or ground the melodic content. And so uh, in a mode in its very basic form, you have primary pitches, you have ornamentation, the way that you embellish the pitch. Um, you can do things like Tap a pitch, or you can add the wrong one. Like that. Uh, so you have different kinds of ornamentation, and then you have pitches that are paired together um, that serve to sort of structure uh, the tune. Back mode pieces, the happy mode pieces, have Chinese counterparts. One constructs a Chinese version of the piece by changing the ornamentation associated with particular pitches and changing the paired notes that structure the piece. In essence, the tonal centers are changed, so certain pitches are emphasized over others. Uh, this chart indicates some of the changes to ornamentation and the paired pitches for the Hei Guang method of playing a piece. Um, so I have this mostly in Vietnamese, I apologize. Uh, these are the um, five pitches uh, of Vietnamese music. Um, I was talking with a gentleman earlier who, who used um, uh, Do, Re, Fa, So, One sometimes to talk about this. Vietnamese musicians will usually use So, La, Do, Re, Mi in order to talk about uh, the five pitches. Um, and although this is the first and primary pitch, Sol uh, is used to designate it. Um, the Ubac ornamentation, Ma, is a tapping ornament. Rum is a vibrato ornament. And in essence, in the Chinese version, um, you flip them. So instead of having a tapping, you uh, ornament it with vibrato. And instead of vibrato, you use the tapping ornament. And then you have paired pitches that are different. Uh, different. And the Ubac in Vietnamese, the Vietnamese version of the tune, um, Sol and Do uh, are the paired pitches in Hai Guan. Uh, you have la and mi as the air pitches together. Um, I'll play you now a brief audio excerpt um, from an interview that I did with a southern Vietnamese musician who demonstrates the musical difference between uh, Liu Bac and Hai Quan. So this is Liu Bac.
So he's just said he's now making it a Vietnamese. So he's making it a Chinese tune. So, to my ears, as someone who's played and studied Vietnamese music for a long time, when I hear those, I hear one is Vietnamese and one is Chinese. And many Vietnamese with whom I've spoken have made similar comments. They can hear the distinction. They don't necessarily know how to explain the distinction between the two. But one sounds Chinese and one sounds Vietnamese. Um, I have heard these nuance adjustments uh, made uh, in performances of instrumental music, and it appears primarily to be used for fun. Um, and oftentimes elicits laughter among an audience when you make the transition into a Chinese tune, people laugh because they understand, oh, now we're supposed to be Chinese, and oh, now we're supposed to be Vietnamese. Um, for people today, uh, for musicians today, it does not appear to be an attempt to reject global or colonial influence, but as a method of establishing Vietnamese music as a separate category. The music performed in a Chinese way sounds different and even strange to the ear. Uh, each time the technique has been explained to me, the piece in its typical Vietnamese way is played first to establish firmly the difference uh, between the music that grew up uh, and developed in Vietnam and the stereotyped sound of Chinese music. A separate corpus of short Chinese tunes also exists in southern Vietnam. These are called the Lan Ca Chia and are used often to pepper longer than Katagu in Gailun performances. Master musician Wu Yu Bao introduced this term to me, indicating that Ga Chia references something that is not real or not serious. He compared Ga Chia to Ga Jun, which means cheeky, important, or speaking out of turn. A Vietnamese dictionary I consulted characterizes Ga Chia pieces as ya ya, meaning twitching, as in a head twitch. Um, and this dictionary also describes this term uh, as depicting pieces that developed from Chao Zhou music. The works themselves do not sound twitchy to me, and I have never heard them described as such outside of this dictionary, but they are informal and can perhaps be cheeky. Um, I will now play an excerpt of one piece uh, of uh, one Gachia piece called Maudan. Um, Mudan uh, uh, Pin. Um, so Laudan is the Vietnamese pronunciation of the Chinese word for Pini. Uh, I recorded this piece in an outdoor restaurant on the banks of the Kan Po River in Kan Po in the Mekong Delta. Um, it was played as the Ngataidu uh, among a group of friends after a day working at their day jobs. Uh, this is an informal setting. Uh, the vocalist forgets her lyrics at some point. Uh, various instruments drop in and out, but this is typical of Taipei performances um, in the Mekong Delta among friends, and oftentimes liquor is being served as well. Um, so that adds to the, some some of the things that happen uh, in, in the performance. Um, but this is played as a kind of cheeky aside that is seen by these instrumentalists as a Chinese tune. <clears throat> That's another way I apologize. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So those are the, the gotcha pieces. Um, I'll skip ahead now and, and talk about ways that Vietnamese musicians engaged with um, Chinese music uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, the gotcha pieces made their way into Vietnamese music in the late 19th century. And this example, um, this next example comes from the mid 20th century. Um, the genre I want to talk about is one called nhạc đỏ, which means literally red music, or nhạc khắc mạng, revolutionary music. Um, I will introduce this genre by playing a composition by Xuân Hâm, uh, titled Xuân Chín Hu, uh, translated as Spring Comes to the Liberated Area. This is a work found on a record uh, that was sold in the United States called Vietnam Will Win, uh, distributed by Parenting Records in 1971. Uh, many of the songs were collected in Cuba uh, in the 1960s. Let's see if I can get this to work. So this is a piece of Vietnamese revolutionary music. Swan Helm wrote the lyrics and the music for this. He was a well-known composer of revolutionary songs who grew up in Penyan province in southern Vietnam, uh, next to the present-day border with Cambodia. In an interview before his death in 1996, he described growing up playing short pieces, including Ben Ban Kim Bi and Muri and Bai Ta and Vân and others, most of which are Ban Ga Chia, um, these sort of cheeky pieces that I just talked about. I hear the influence of these tunes in Xuân Chín Hu, especially in the use of certain vocal inflections at the top of the vocalist's range. Uh, in published interviews, he does not address this influence specifically, but he does note the work adopted, quote, the ingenious variations of the work Bin Ban Yen, a song of the people of the Dong Nai Gu Long Plain, end quote, in southern Vietnam. In addition to the influence of these tunes, these tunes that came uh, or are seen as Chinese tunes, uh, the brief invocations of modality in this recording have similarities to the hui guang, or Chinese moral nuance, that I described earlier. Um, the scale of the piece is built on the same set of pitches that I indicated uh, earlier. Um, the two primary paired pitches, however, are not always um, and sang as would be found in Bin Ban Yen. So um, for most of the piece, um, the paired pitches that kind of center the mode uh, are these paired pitches here of Hei Guan, uh, indicating some attempt to uh, evoke uh, a stereotypical Chinese music. Um, and what I try to do uh, in a longer version of this paper using this example is say that um, can we actually find these sounds, these quote-unquote Chinese sounds in China today? I'm not sure. Um, but at least these are sort of the stereotyped ways that Vietnamese have constructed Chinese music uh, in Vietnam today. This theory was helped uh, when I presented a version of this paper at a conference last year. And after I played this particular <coughs> revolutionary song, um, a well-known historian of Vietnam turned to the person next to her and said, this sounds really Chinese. <laughs> Coming to the contemporary period, in the past 10 to 15 years, Vietnamese musicians of traditional music have undertaken new engagements with the music of China. These have involved often direct interaction with contemporary music production. During a trip to Ho Chi Minh City in 2013, for example, I found a bootleg copy of a Bujang compact disc for purchase in a music shop. This is the first time I had found this, um, but I, I, I saw it uh, and I remembered that a lot of my musician friends uh, had told me how much they appreciated the sound of the Bujang and they tried to um, mimic the sound of the Bujang when they played the Vietnamese Dan Chai. Um, there's also a great affinity for many Vietnamese musicians uh, for flute playing. Um, xiao playing or jitsu playing. Um, one friend of mine, Book, plays the vertical flute, 
uh, in Vietnamese Dong Diu, but he often refers to the instrument as Dong Xiao, uh, adopting the Chinese term, uh, although he is Vietnamese and not of Chinese descent. Uh, other musicians I have known have traveled to China to study Chinese instruments in order to find inspiration for contemporary Vietnamese practice. In 2013, I met a high school age student of the Diu and Sao flutes, uh, who attended a music school in Guangxi to study the Dizhi. Um, my friend Fook introduced <coughs> me to this student. Uh, during that introduction, Fook argued that uh, he finds Chinese flute music richer than Vietnamese flute music. And the high school student found this opinion valid. Both argued later in the conversation that Vietnamese flute music, as well as the Mkatai Du, the southern traditional genre of music, the southern Vietnamese genre of music, uh, both these Vietnamese genres suffer from smoothness or serenity in their words, while Chinese music is more violent or adventurous. They didn't mean violent in a bad way. They meant violent as sort of getting you excited. Mm -hmm. um, both of these individuals study Chinese music not to replace Vietnamese music with Chinese tunes and timbres, but to inject certain exciting musical elements specific to Chinese music into what they consider to be a lackluster Vietnamese tradition. <coughs> I found out later that this high school age student had received a number of high profile awards in Vietnam for his food performances, um, indicating that he was somewhat accepted by the Vietnamese music community. Recently, however, this has changed. He has been attacked uh, as playing in a too Chinese way. Um, he had hoped to study at the Shanghai Conservatory, um, but this past December I learned that he has returned to Vietnam to resume his music studies. And I heard that his parents and his friends said, OK, your music is now too Chinese. You have to come back to Vietnam and rediscover your roots. So clearly, there's sort of a give and take uh, between uh, what constitutes good adoption of Chinese aesthetics and what is, constitutes too much. Um, other engagements with Chinese music take place through festivals and direct engagement with Chinese and Vietnamese artists. However, recently, this has also been fraught with difficulty. Uh, one of my teachers in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Fang Tui Huan, is a composer and a former zither instructor at the Ho Chi Minh City Conservatory. Uh, she has organized sustained musical engagements between Vietnamese Dan Chai performers and teachers of zithers based in Korea, Japan, and China. She and some of her students attend performances and festivals outside of Vietnam uh, to interact with these musicians. She also holds what she calls Asian, Asian Zither Festivals in Ho Chi Minh City. These festivals bring musicians from Japan, South Korea, mainland China, Taiwan, and Singapore to Vietnam in order to showcase the zithers in performance and enable exchange between these zitherists and those from abroad. In an interview with me, Pham Thuy Huan outlined three explicit goals in developing these festivals in 2008 and 2009. Um, she wants Vietnamese musicians and members of the Vietnamese public to interact with one another. Um, she wants members of the Vietnamese public to be made aware of the existence of different forms of the zither in East Asia, to kind of see the way that the zither exists within a larger family. Um, and she's also, she also hoped that Vietnamese members of the public would come in, hear this music, and see the way that Vietnamese music was distinct and unique as compared with the other traditions. Um, these kinds of exchanges have enabled cross-fertilization of performance techniques, um, some of which were highlighted in performances at the second Asian Zither Festival in 2008. Um, since I realize I'm running low on time, I will not play an extensive, uh, I will not play um, an excerpt from this performance, um, but this is a piece of music uh, written by Fan Tui Huan. It means a love song of the South, and it's an interesting new song for the Zither, uh, that incorporates uh, a number of different folk melodies from southern Vietnam, but oftentimes these folk melodies are played using techniques borrowed from the Bucheon. Um, and so the technique of, uh, let me find the correct term, um, Yao Chi on the Gujan when you sort of do a tremolo quickly like this. Um, this is something that's not easily done on the Vietnamese zither because of the nature of the, of the plectrum. Uh, on the Vietnamese zither, uh, the plectra are curved inwards to, um, so none of you can see this, I apologize, but the plectra is curved like this, so you can really only play the string in one direction. Um, Chinese guzhan um, uh, plectra are flat, 
um, that you tape to the finger, and so you can more easily go back and forth like this. Um, but in this particular piece, she asked her daughter to play it with a Vietnamese plectrum and said, well, to sort of work through it so you can imitate that Chinese technique. Um, there are also, there are some techniques of producing harmonics on the Wuzheng that are not found in the Vietnamese tradition, but are found in this particular piece. Given the success of the first and second Asian Zither festivals, a third festival was scheduled for this past July in Chi Minh City. Um, it, would have, it would have enabled interactions not only between Vietnamese musicians, but also musicians from China, Japan, Korea, as well as, for the first time, musicians from the Vietnamese diaspora who were coming from uh, Houston and Seattle to Ho Chi Minh City in order to engage with Vietnamese musicians as well as other Zitherists from Asia. A few months before the planned start of the festival, concerns were raised about inviting Chinese artists to Ho Chi Minh City due to the, due to the current frosty relationship between the two countries. Although Vietnamese artists with whom I spoke thought these concerns were unwarranted, the festival ultimately was canceled out of abundance of caution. <coughs> to conclude, a very brief note about what I call post-socialist creativity. Creativity intersects and emerges from experiences engaging with authority and is therefore fraught with conflict and disagreement. In this paper, I have positioned Vietnamese traditional music in the contemporary period, and to a certain degree historically, as developed from certain kinds of engagements with Chinese sounds, musical models, and aesthetics. The ultimate goal in these maneuverings has always been sustainability, one tied to uh, sustainability tied to diversity and mobility as musicians increase the number of sounds with which they play, and as musicians draw upon the power of movement, uh, either gaining new knowledge by going to China to perform or bringing sounds into one's corpus in order to make a strategic musical alliance. These movements and developments are interrupted sometimes by geopolitical realities. However, I view them as increasingly in Vietnam post-socialist. In Narcius Tolber's conceptualization of the term, post-socialism post stands, quote, either for the diversity of social formations emerging after socialism, or for a particular style of doing ethnographic work, which is more attentive to meanings, values, and local experiences, focusing on themes like memory, consumption, identity, nationalism, etc. Thus, post-socialism incorporated all the ambiguity inherent in the processes of social change, end quote. Vietnam is changing very, very quickly today as it increasingly engages with the global, engages with the global world. Vietnam today is still the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. However, the fervent uh, nationalism in response to disagreements in the South China Sea and the turn towards neoliberal models of production and consumption indicate a new positioning on the world stage. For many musicians, adopting from Chinese music um, and adopting, again, what one of my friends called this sort of violent or exciting aesthetic, gets Vietnamese musicians onto the world stage. Um, in addition, there's another strain of post-socialist thought that draws on post-colonial theory, which has sort of peppered this talk. Um, <coughs> Vietnam, for many, is a multi-post-colonial state, dealing with rule from China, France, and some would argue the United States as well. Uh, deploying Chinese music as part of Vietnamese cultural production is one way to make sense of this profound messiness. Uh, using Chinese sounds because it becomes a way to make sense of the ambiguity um, of living in contemporary Vietnam, which in turn generates creative music. Most of the examples I present here come from genres of southern Vietnamese music. The examples of revolutionary music and newly composed music draw upon traditional and folk music to root the works in some form of Vietnamese identity, be it regional or national. <coughs> Techniques are not always presented as Chinese in Vietnamese performance spaces. However, they are deployed strategically to enliven and sustain Vietnamese music in an extraordinarily complicated cultural sphere. So one instance of musical notation. So I'm curious about how important notation is in the flow of music ideas between China and Vietnam. You have different practices. Mm -hmm. It's interesting the Western notation that you showed us. Cipher mm -hmm. uh, um, notation is more important than the CRC, for instance. Mm -hmm. And you have more traditional forms, also mm -hmm. notation, etc. 
about so how important has uh, written notation been? And in those styles of notation, can you get the ornamentation that some people mm -hmm. might think would be the essence of Vietnameseness or the essence of Chinese? Yes. Um, notation um, has not been standardized uh, or systematized in Vietnam as it has been in, in, in China. Um, there are some very, the first Vietnamese notation on record is an extension of Chinese music notation. And I don't know enough about Chinese music notation to be able to do, to do a good deal of comparison. But my readings of particular texts, the Chen Wen Kei's text in French, for example, he talks about how the Vietnamese just adopted directly from, from Chinese notation because it worked and it would work for Vietnamese musicians as, as well. But my understanding is that this was only really done, and perhaps this is true in China as well, um, in certain very high social classes. Yes, some are very textual, some are not. Yes. Some forms are very textual, some are not. Yes. Um, so notation in Vietnam is there is some notation that draws upon Chinese characters, um, but my understanding of that is that notation doesn't really indicate ornamentation; it just d depicts pitch content. Unlike some uh, quite beautiful Chinese notation that I can't read, um, that does indicate ornamentation and ways of playing the instrument. Uh, and so I wonder if some of these distinctions in ornamentation have come from the oral means, or the passing of music by oral means only. Um, so you don't have a text to go back to one musician and teaches it to another, um, which is partly why, in, you know, in some instances, we have similar piece titles in different areas, but they are completely different pieces. So somewhere along the line, um, things were not passed directly, like the telephone game. Um, but there are, as I mentioned, there are some pieces that are very, very similar, but have completely different names uh, in the two areas. Um, so I think, again, some of that uh, distinction has to do with notation. Now, uh, other kinds of Vietnamese notation. Um, there's no cipher notation in Vietnam. Uh, there is a notation where you write out um, pitch names, false sense they come um, but that only gives you pitch content. It does not give you rhythm. It does not give you ornamentation. So all of those other bits you have to rely upon oral transmission in order to understand. Um, now people are sometimes using uh, Western notation, but even these pitches are inexact. Um, sometimes someone will look at a pitch that looks like an E or is an E on Western staff notation and they will interpret that as either one pitch or another, um, one Vietnamese pitch or another Vietnamese pitch, dependent upon the context. So I can't necessarily go in and play a particular piece without having heard it first from someone else. Yes, please. Was there any lasting influence of either the French uh, period of domination or the American you know, subsequent uh, did it last? And was there any influence and did it last? Yes, in both instances, <coughs> yes. Uh, with the uh, American influence was primarily in popular music. Um, there is an extraordinary amount of popular music produced in Vietnamese that mimicked rock uh, from the 1960s and 70s in Saigon. Most of that has disappeared, um, but some people are starting to bring it back. Um, there are restaurants in Virginia City, for example, that play this music, and some bands are starting to pick up on it again. Uh, the French influence is uh, pretty significant and still remains very significant um, in a couple of different ways. One, the conservatory systems are based upon the French models. So the ways that music is taught today um, is based upon the French model. This has caused some difficulties, though, um, at all of the conservatories in Vietnam. Uh, the traditional music sections of the conservatories are considered subpar. The joke goes that if you flunk out of the Western music side, you're told, why don't you learn this other? And you're just kind of gently pushed into the traditional music side. I think this is partly because the French model doesn't fit 
with traditional music. It fits with um, European art music, with European classical music. Um, so it works fairly well. But when they tried to fit traditional music into that model, it didn't work so well. Um, in terms of French sound, um, when I was in the Mekong Delta, uh, I heard um, a piece that was played um, on a, 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 a lute called the Dan Sen, uh, which looks exactly like the Mekwa Jin, or Jin Jin, a uh, six-sided lute uh, from southern China. Um, and this instrumentalist was playing this piece for me, and he said, okay, listen to this piece. It's called Nyak Mia Nyak Bap, which means Khmer music, French music. Literally, Khmer music, French music. And the French part of this song was um, a Vietnamized version of the Tino Rossi tune called Se Apakli. So, and this sound has existed in Vietnam for decades. Um, it's been passed along from one musician to another. Uh, if I can return just very briefly to American influence, I also had another musician play Oh Susanna on this loop for me. So these influences do remain in Vietnam today. Yes, please. Um, you had mentioned about the flute music, the Chinese being more of the um, as you put it in the softer, would you say the string, um, though it's reversed, the Vietnamese seem to, the uh, samples you played seem to be more moving, whereas the Chinese was more tranquil. And so. Oh, that that's interesting. I um, it's sort of the, the the smooth and violent dichotomy that I create. Those are words that I translated from Vietnamese into. Um, so these were words that were used by them. Um, and that's an, again, that's an interesting observation that you made. Um, I think when the one musician was referring to sort of the violent sound or the powerful sound, um, he had in mind particular ways of playing the Chinese flute, um, the ditsa and the sao, um, but also certain ways of playing the guzhou. Um, I have students at Western Michigan University who have found these pieces of Wuchang music where you have performers sort of playing like this and playing really strong with a good deal of force because the, the instrument can, can maintain it. The, thing, the, the strings are much thicker than this, than this instrument. And that sort of power, that forcefulness, that richness of sound is sort of what they were referring to. Um, it's also a very modern sound that they're referring to. This is sort of a, a more recent development in Chinese music, as far as I understand. Um, and for many Vietnamese, they want to get there. They want to have that kind of sound where my students are finding Vietnamese videos of someone playing it in China and not Wujung videos. The piece of Chinese music that I played, that is from a much older tradition, which is a primarily an amateur music making tradition. Uh, these performers are probably professionals, but historically, Jiangnan Jiang Nan Soju was a, an amateur music making uh, tradition. People went to tea houses to create this music together. I think just one other note sure. is that piece that seemed uh, to be a little Vietnamese klezmer, uh, mm -hmm. if you recall what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That was the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. By the way, on the Vietnamese music, uh, are there particular pieces that are sort of international, or it is a required study for one of these instruments? Like in, in Chinese music and also Western music, if you play the piano, you have to play a piece by Mozart, Beethoven, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In Chinese opera, for example, the more modern version is uh, Archery in Europe. Is about two strings reflecting the mood. Mm -hmm. So do you have representation music from Vietnam, that if you study the, I, I forgot the name of that. Nankong. Nankong. Yeah. That you have to learn how to play that piece, which is typical Vietnamese. Um, this is found on a much smaller scale. Um, it's, a, it's either a regional scale or sometimes teacher genealogies. If you are working with a particular teacher, there are certain pieces that you must know how to play. Um, if you're playing within a particular genre, um, say, you have to be able to play the flow in the water piece. Um, you have to be able to play that piece pretty well. Uh, but in terms of international recognition, no. There, and 
this is a point of, this is a, the, the last teacher that I talked about, Fang Tui Huang, the one who wrote this piece that incorporates Vietnamese tunes and Chinese performance techniques. This is something that she's trying to do. She tells a story about one of the Asian zither festivals where um, uh, there was a group of musicians, uh, a group of musicians from um, uh, China, uh, China, Vietnam, uh, Korea, and Japan on the stage. The Japanese contingent played Sakura, and everyone knew it. Uh, the Korean contingent played Arirang, and everybody knew it. And then the Vietnamese contingent played a piece that no one knew how to play. And Phan Thuy Luang thought, I've got to do something about this. I have to try to find some piece that everyone can start to learn. And she has, there are two pieces that she's trying to do that with, but she hasn't been successful yet. Okay, no more questions? Okay. Yeah, just so, one more. Uh, oh. This is kind of off point, but. <clears throat> Prior to the introduction of the Romanized alphabet during the French occupation, they used an ideographic or pictographic written language that was very similar to Chinese. It was very similar to Chinese, yes. Okay. So some people use Chinese characters, and then there's also another notation of the words that's an ideographic notation. And the language is based, the Romanized language is based upon that Vietnamese um, character system. So thank you for having me. Yes, thank you.